Hello. Hello. Internet. Happy Thursday. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks for joining us here at Coded Live. I'm your host, Sam Basu. And with me today, I have my very good friend, David Pine. Hello, How are you, sir. I am fantastic for a Thursday. No complaints. <laughs> it is Thursday. And uh, thankfully, today, you're not going to watch me code. <laughs> uh, but it is another yeah it is another dev show so we are here uh and um david uh, is a long time friend but uh david tell us a little bit about who you are absolutely uh, my name is david pine i work for microsoft in developer relations um, i focus on content development and what's that what that really means is um i i write uh, documentation such as tutorials and quick starts and conceptual uh, articles and I host the .NET Doc Show uh, along with other friends. Um, I join uh, streams such as yours uh, and uh, other things from Telerik, which have been fun. Um, I speak at conferences. I do all sorts of um, advocacy and evangelism type things. Um, anything to help share .NET love. Yeah, yeah well said. And uh, some of our friends are showing up in the chat room. Hey, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, David and me are both in our bedroom closets, and <laughs> he's got code, and I got kitchen, so you can see where like our priorities lie. And yeah, that was a fun time in uh, Bulgaria. So what uh, Dan is referring to here is um, <laughs> all of us uh, had been over to uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, for DevReach, and it was a fun time. And uh, let's just say there were some pictures taken that should probably not make it out to the internet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's that's really funny. That I I I feel like every time I come on uh, a Telerik um, stream that this is somehow brought up, and it's not. It's going to be my legacy. It's hysterical. It's, it's yeah, hysterical. you're not going to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, you and Scott Addy and Cam and everybody else, you do an amazing job with the .NET. Docs show, so we, we get to learn a whole bunch. And I know you have written a whole lot of tutorials, one of them kind of close and uh, near and dear to your heart, and that's GitHub Actions, right? Yep. So um, give us a kind of a rundown. So are you ready to share your desktop? Absolutely. Let's do it. Bring it up. Mm -hmm. So um, let, let's back up a step, because uh, mm -hmm. we, we hear a lot about GitHub Actions. Um, yes. What is it, and and how can this help with our workflows? So yeah, GitHub Actions are uh, they're a newer type thing that's based on like a pipeline uh, workflow. So what it does is it allows you, as an admin of a repository in GitHub, to create uh, or compose different workflows that um, can help with you know, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So with .NET specifically, you can use GitHub Actions to build, test, and deploy. But in addition to that, you can do a lot more. So you're not just limited to some of those DevOpsy type things. You can actually interact with pull requests. You can interact with issues. Uh, you can, so from anything that you could you know, imagine automating, you can send messages, you could send emails, you can do, you could tie it to logic apps. I've written GitHub Actions that'll actually um, evaluate .NET source code, for example, uh, with RESX files and use Azure Cognitive Services to perform localization. So it'll mm -hmm. machine translate your code for you and then give you a pull request with all the files. So it's like anything that you can imagine uh, is, is really possible with this. And it lets you kind of hook into their system and do all sorts of fun stuff. Okay, so is it uh, tied to the type of app that you're building? So, I mean, could I do it from like a Blazor app versus a Xamarin app? Um, so, like, if so, it has to do with like the source control aspect of it, right? So, like, you've got right. a repository in GitHub. So, if you mm -hmm. have a Blazor app that way, uh, that source code you could you know leverage GitHub Actions to do some sort of thing on it. But I guess, are you saying like if you had a Blazor app that was running and pulling something from GitHub Actions? Oh, no, no, or like... no, no. That, that's what I meant. Like <coughs> any any type of app that you push out to source code to yeah. GitHub, this can work on. Right? Absolutely. Any type of app. Absolutely. Anything that's inside GitHub. Yeah. Uh, OK, so you're going to talk about how to actually create an, a custom workflow and action with .NET, correct? 
Yeah, yeah. So this okay. is kind of flipping it on its head a bit. So a lot of the yeah. stuff that has existed in terms of uh, content was uh, provided from our friends at GitHub already. And they show you how to take a .NET app and build it, test it, and deploy it. So what they use is a workflow composition. So with the workflow uh, YAML file inside your uh, GitHub Actions folder, you'll basically define uh, your, your steps. Uh, you define a job and it has steps and then you kind of work through sequentially what you want it to do. So it's gonna check out the code, it's gonna pull it local to it and, and make sure it's got the latest bits from that um, pull request, for example. It's, the, it's going to then reach out into uh, the .NET CLI and build and test and deploy your code. So that's that's pretty standard, that's basic stuff. And that's using the .NET CLI, right? Mm -hmm. What I've done here is I've actually written an application, like a full-blown .NET app that is spun up in the context of a Docker container. So then we're kind of unbounded. We can literally do anything. So rather than just kind of being like a script kitty and writing scripty things with you know CLI stuff, you can write a full-blown mature application to pull in, you know, external third-party NuGet packages and um, libraries and and do whatever you want. So uh, the intent of this app, I, I had reached out on Twitter and I asked some friends like, hey, what would you like to see done? And the thing I ended up landing on was um, basically doing code, uh, code metric analysis. Okay, so David, I have I'm 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 a few little confused with a few things you said. <laughs> so I want to dive a little bit more. But uh, before we get into this, um, mm -hmm. Dan is asking where he can steal the ResX GitHub Action thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, let's see. If you go to my GitHub uh, account, iEvangelist, I'll post a link here. But um, so I'll show you that real quick. Give me a second. So it's called Resource Translator. And this was my first GitHub action that I wrote. It's available in the marketplace. I'm gonna paste it here in private chat. Uh, but what this does, the resource translator actually um, works against several different types of files. So it uses INI, PO, RES text, RESX, and XLIF. So it has parsers for all of these things. So what you would do to consume it is uh, you specify the branch you're curious about, the, the paths that you want this to be triggered on. You pass it your environment variable for your GitHub token, which you get out of the box for free. So when you have, uh, when you start composing um, GitHub actions uh, as part of the workflow composition, GitHub actually automatically provides the GitHub token for you as a secret so this is an encrypted value that's you know totally secure that you can then pass to your uh actions and it's contextual and it's like a, a token specific to the execution of that job right uh so then this is going to run on uh, ubuntu we're going to check some stuff out and then this is the actual machine translator bit so it uses iEvangelist Resource Translator 2.1.1. And we say our source locale is English, our subscription key. So this is where Azure comes into play. So we're going to save a couple other secrets. We're going to have, we're going to spin up a, a translator subscription. Um, so the Azure Cognitive Services resource, you actually have a free tier for that. So you can get, I, I forget what the limit is, like 250,000 characters per month or something like that for free. So you can get a lot of bang for your buck really really inexpensively so you configure the the subscription key the endpoint and the region and then you say here's what i want it to be translated to right so english french or german and then uh this uh individual github action here will output whether or not it has translations and if it does it'll create a pull request with those so then you'll end up, as you're changing like your source English files, for example, and any of those formats that you specified, you'll get corresponding pull requests for the translated bits after you push that into your, your branch. So it's- Interesting. Yeah, that one was a lot of fun to write. Hmm. And it's available in the marketplace, go check it out. Um, and it's extensible too. So what I mean by that is, uh, since th this is my first one I wrote and this was with TypeScript. So I have, I've got a big passion for TypeScript and also C sharp. Um, but there's different file formats. Uh, so of the different file formats, uh, there's parsers for each of those. So let me see. It's been a while since I've been in here. 
API factories, not that one. Oh, actually, maybe this will show a bit. So each, depending on what um, file kind we have, we have an individual parser. So based on the implementation details of the translation file parser, um, anyone can go in here and give me a pull request if they were, they're like, oh, we're missing this type of file. And actually someone had posted an issue in here and they're like, why don't you support uh, <laughs> I-18 next JSON? Um, so this I don't is- I you know, know what that is. It, it's a different file format, right? Huh. So all you have to do is put a pull request in here and add that little switch um, switch statement with the new parser for the I, whatever the I JSON next or whatever the thing is. And as long as it implements this interface and does uh, provides those things correctly, basically how to read and write back that file, it'll make those calls out and, uh, and translate the files and it'll hook in and every, life, is, life is good. So yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that question, Dan. Well, this is good. And uh, David, you and me can go home because uh, uh, Chris is in the house. Uh, I know. You, you, Love well, Chris. Maybe, maybe I should drop out because, like, the two of you are in, inseparable. <laughs> well, hey, no, it's just proof that my hands are up here and he typed that. So we are different people, Joe. Uh, yeah. It's funny. Uh, international X for extension. I don't know. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's probably the, the, the file format that he's talking about. So. Uh, we, we should have another session where we implement that. We go right and do a pull request, and that'd be fun. And, uh, and Joe still doesn't believe you. You probably have some macros <laughs> going. Who knows? Who knows? Oh, yeah. that's funny. Okay. Um, so uh, for the tutorial that you wanted to talk about, I mm -hmm. think I posted a link, but that's also an AKMS link, and I think it's .net-gh-action. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Yes. That's the that's the URL. That's the full URL. Yep. Yep. Uh, so in this tutorial, the intent of the app was actually to uh, to be hooked in with .NET repos. So it's a .NET app that's going to do code metrics for .NET repository. So it's isolated mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, so the intent is really to discover um, CS, Proj, and VB Proj. It doesn't work with F Sharp. So if you've got Visual Basic or C Sharp code, uh, you could hook this in. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to provide uh, uh, code metrics analysis. It's going to evaluate cyclomatic complexity, the maintainability index, the depth of inheritance, class coupling, the number of lines of code, the approximated number uh, of executable lines of code. And it's going to basically create and or update uh, a, a code metrics markdown file on your behalf. So Thank you'll you end up, yeah. so as, as you make source code changes uh, to your, your .NET repository, with this GitHub action in place, it'll run after every time you push to, to, to main, for example. And if there's no code metrics markdown file that exists, it'll create a pull request for a, for a new one. In that code metrics file, will actually be an automated markdown file that has all of the hierarchy of uh, your your libraries. So it, it's really, really compelling in the sense that, uh, I'm gonna show you real quick some of the end results here. So this is this is essentially the .NET samples repo and uh, inside the samples root, you'll see that we have, um, wait for it to load here. We've got our .github, this is where basically things are composed. So in here, we've got our workflows and we've got the .NET code metrics YAML file. So this YAML file, this is really a workflow. And what it does is um, you, you specify kind of how you want it to, to interact with your repository. So this is the name, so .NET code metrics. This is the name that will appear on a badge if you were to create like a status uh, badge for this action. And you say on push to main, and here are the paths. So you can do like globbing expressions and say, I want to look into the GitHub actions dot GitHub action uh, asterisk asterisk. So anything inside here that is not the code metrics markdown file because that's automatically generated. So we don't we don't want to really trigger on ourselves. Um, and then there's a special one here called I don't know if it's hard to see. Let me zoom in one more. 
this is this is called a workflow underscore dispatch and what this allows us to do is manually run that from the github ui so with this in place you can specify an input and a reason and a description whether or not it's required and like a default value so to really show you that in action let's open up the actions tab and then from here we can go to dotnet code metrics and then see how this if I go to CodeQL, for example, it doesn't have a um, uh, an explicit workflow dispatch, but the code metrics one does. So you end up with this event trigger here. So what we can do is manually run that from the GitHub UI. So if I was to hit run workflow, it would say on main, and then this is, see the string here? The reason mm -hmm. for running the workflow. That's, that's literally, the YAML. Yep. yeah, that's pulled from the YAML file. So the, the UI is smart enough to dynamically pull those and it's got a default value. So if I was to run this workflow, it would then kick that off. And then uh, later on, you can see that if it was manually ran, uh, where is that? Ba, 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 ba. Print manual run reason. So if the GitHub event name was workflow dispatch, then we could echo out the reason. So then in our logs, we actually have traceability into uh, the reason that this thing was ran, which is pretty yeah. amazing, right? <clears throat> right. So you made Dan happy that you're able to manually run an action, but you also <laughs> made him sad with your VB support. <laughs> well, VB support is uh, it, it's it's there. Uh, so it came free of charge. It's not like I went out of my way to to add that. Um, yeah. So. And I, I want to dive in a little bit, or maybe maybe you're like after you run through this, because I'm a little confused with like the runtime, like what's hosting this. Like you you said CLI at one point, and then I mean the mm -hmm. other example had had Ubuntu. So like mm -hmm. who, who's bootstrapping this? Right, right. Yep, we'll get into that in just okay. a second. Um, so the this is what I like to refer to as uh, workflow composition. So it's really the composing of different GitHub actions together in a composition. So our job is to build. The build name is what shows up inside your action logs. Um, so if we click on that, you would see like inside there, you'll get details that say build. Uh, we say it runs on Ubuntu. And then our steps are basically delegating out to individual uh, GitHub actions. So there's an action that exists to simply check out your code. So in the context of uh, Ubuntu, so basically it spins up um, your hosted runner, uh, or you can have isolated runners, but uh, it spins up a VM, you know, that is Ubuntu. And then from there, it's gonna rely on these individual steps. So the first one is gonna use checkout. So that's gonna pull all of your source code into that VM, into that environment, right? The hosted environment. And then from there, the next step is to print the manual reason if there was one. So you can imagine if this is ran as, um, if it's ran automatically from one of these triggers, that's not going to print out, right? It's just going to happen implicitly on your behalf. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to actually rely on source code within this repository itself. So it uses .NET samples, GitHub Actions, the action source code that lives here. So this is the source code for the .NET app. And as you can see, there's a Docker file, there's a YAML file. Uh, this action.yaml file is what it uses to trigger and kind of identify itself as a GitHub action. So once it spins up, um, we have okay. an... Imp I, I have a few more questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of moving parts here. So this is... Yeah, you know, I mean, sorry, you're, you're stuck with my dumbness today. No, no, so this I is good. Questions. It, um, you asking questions that other people are probably thinking the same thing. Uh, but before we go on, um, Chris is asking something out of context here, but uh, Teams bought with JavaScript. Uh, no, it should not be too hard. I think they are nicely written up docs. Uh, but I mean, helps too. Do doesn't Chris hate JavaScript? So why would he want, I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you want to build a Teams bot with CSS and HTML? Well, I mean, you, you can also like, uh, so, so some of these things are actually really powerful, like the Teams integrations, like the little apps and uh, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it is kind of like uh, low code. You can actually roll your own with uh, just hooking together some of the pieces in, in a complete workflow. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting off topic here, but Teams is like, uh, it's an amazing thing. If you look at all the integrations, all the things you can do. Absolutely. And, um, <clears throat> 
Yeah, I, I am not. Oh, so Dave and uh, no, so Joe and uh, Chris are still trying to prove to each other that you and him are not the same person. They're going <laughs> to teams and trying to ping each other. <laughs> oh, God. oh boy. yeah, yeah. Okay, so questions here. Yes. Um, why Ubuntu? Um, the other options are like I think Windows latest or some other thing. I don't. I, I guess I just have always uh, relied on Ubuntu, and since it's .NET, uh, well, so here's one. I guess one primary reason for me uh, is to have a .NET application spun up in the context of a GitHub action. It has to either be the CLI, right? Something that's like a, a global tool that .NET CLI would call into, or it has to be a, a full-blown .NET application that is backed by, uh, that's containerized. So it's a, it's a Docker container because um, inside our YAML, because uh, uh, so basically GitHub Actions, there's two flavors. There's JavaScript, right? So the one I wrote was in TypeScript. So it compiles down to JavaScript and then it's, that it just works natively because, uh, you know, Node.js and all that stuff. Uh, the other one that is available is Docker containers. So anything that can be containerized can then be called into from, um, yeah, and, and jo, as Joe says, Ubuntu is typically, you know, uh, faster and smaller. Um, and, and that's definitely true here. But since it's a .NET container, I, I'd rather use um, Ubuntu rather than like a Windows container because there's fun stuff there. So. Yeah. Okay, and then I was second question. I was confused when you said uh, when you when you do actions uh, forward slash checkout, who who is checking that out and how is that getting loaded up? Like who's parsing through this file? Um, so GitHub. So th think of it this way: you're a developer and you're using GitHub, right? To to as your source code uh, source code provider. So. As you push code, so imagine you've got a pull request and uh, you have a, a, a GitHub action in place that will hook into you pushing source code from that pull request into the main branch, right? So you're going from a feature branch into main and you've got a GitHub action that triggers on that. When that occurs, that action will fire off. GitHub itself will evaluate that there's an action here. Yeah. Basically, it's I think it's using the webhook stuff internally. It parses this YAML file and says, all right, here's the pipeline that we're going to execute for this given trigger, right? Yeah. So now that it's happening, it's going to go spin up the VM um, or the environment, and then it's going to have the, the VM basically execute these steps. So the VM, in the context of this individual trigger, is going to say, we're going to check out the code at this point in time. So it's got all the code available to it. And then from there, we can do stuff with it. And then if uh, the GitHub Actions, uh, this one triggers and says that there's some updated metrics, then we can rely on another composed GitHub Action in our flow that will do something else. So Peter Evans have, has created a create pull request. So it'll basically evaluate. So this GitHub Action itself, uh, I guess that's one of my recommendations is if you're composing, or if you're writing um, GitHub Actions, try to write them small and don't make them monolithic, right? Make them almost like microservices, have them be mm -hmm. very isolated with their intent. So uh, for example, checkout does one thing. All it does is check out the source code into a workspace. Um, create pull request. All it does is evaluate deltas and determine whether or not it can actually create a pull request. If there's no changes, nothing, it's a no op. Uh, the code metrics, this one evaluates uh, the code metrics for uh, the .NET repository in context, and it'll write a code metrics markdown file on your behalf. And then, right, so it doesn't actually create the pull request. I'm using something else in the composition, the create pull request, that will create the pull request for me. So I don't want to bake that into my GitHub action. Got it. Got it. So does that okay. make sense? Kind of like the different yeah. Yeah, yeah. moving parts? Okay. Um, Chris is saying open source. Uh, I don't know what you mean, Chris. Open like source? Open source. <laughs> that, that, that's a I don't know, like the flavor of um, uh, Linux that you're talking about. I don't know. And the scoop said something about Alpine. Uh, I also don't follow what that means. Alpine is uh, like that goes back to Joe's point earlier. Alpine is um, 
uh, a much smaller and faster uh, rev, I think, of uh, Ubuntu, like the Linux OS. Yeah, but um, OpenSUSE is a flavor of Linux, ah, so is Alpine. Yeah, yeah. So is Alpine. Um, but like, are you able to control which one, or is it just like you you tell it to go uh, kind of bootstrap Ubuntu and that's um, it? Let me see. GitHub actions runs on options. Here we go. Press buttons. Let's see if my Microsoft Bing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and me are the only two people using Bing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, right runs right. on, runs on, runs on, runs on, runs on coffee, right? Here you go. Here's the options. So mm -hmm. uh, available GitHub hosted runners are Windows latest or Windows 2019, Windows 2016 Ubuntu latest or Ubuntu 20.04, uh, yeah. Ubuntu older versions, yeah, Mac, other stuff. Yeah, so some then, other thing uh, than Mac. Yeah, your Mac, Mac is there. <laughs> But uh, yeah, okay. So you, you it, it tells you right there what uh, versions there are. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know if you can like choose, but it, it is like one of those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I've had I've had no problems with the speed in which um, my container has spun up in the context of the Ubuntu latest. Like GitHub Actions happen really, really rapidly, and under under 60 seconds for the entire thing to be evaluated and spit out the results so it's it's really i think pretty impressive with the amount of stuff that's actually happening because in the context of that vm it actually has to download uh the the uh, the container image and so that could be you know 200 megabytes for example and it's got to spin it up and then it's got to actually execute it and then it's got to write some stuff back out and there's like i said there's a lot of moving parts um yeah. but it's really powerful that you can do all that and all of this is like it's it's free as long as it's you're doing stuff on open source GitHub, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so let me actually show you uh, the output file real quick. I mean, this shows some of like the different moving parts here, but I actually have the ID uh, open itself. Um, so this is the file that was. Uh, let's actually look at this real quick. So here's a pull request that came through. <clears throat> so this well, pull. This no, sorry, I, was just, uh, I was just going to mention, like, uh, looks like Dan also uses Bing. So oh, just, the one honest. other person. No. <laughs> no, so this this may be a, a little commercial here for Bing, but uh, Bing gives you points, reward points. Uh, it does. The more you search, yeah. and, and you can redeem those for, like, whatever you want. So. Yep, yep. That is right very, there. very true. Um, so what uh, what happened was I had updated the source code for the sample um the project itself like the, the github action.net source code and the uh workflow saw that i changed it and it's like well we need to actually update the markdown file now uh with those changes so this is the pull request from github actions the bot so this this bot itself is actually what spun up evaluated this and then created the pull request that i was then able to review and uh, so, so bots are helping us essentially, right? Robots are taking over, uh, and it's great. Uh, okay, so <laughs> in in my source code, when I'm just checking stuff in, like, do I need to have the code metrics file, or you will create that the first time you run it? Uh, I'll create it the first time it's okay. ran. Yeah, and if if it's not there, it'll be created for you, uh, which is which is kind of cool. And then it will update, right? So pull requests here to to update it. So what I did was I made a change to make it. Um, uh, make sure that everything is kind of sorted alphabetically so that it's consistent. So it's not just churning on, you know, um, undeterministic changes. So uh, I'm going to show you the file itself because it's, I think it's kind of cool. So the code metrics file itself is uh, uh, basically uh, it shows the individual projects. And then at the top, I bubble up uh, emojis that represent uh the code complexity like the cyclomatic complexity so the higher the complexity the the more painful it is this so this is the mm -hmm. the quake feels good uh you know really really bad like bleeding yeah. face like oh my gosh this is bad right and then each of the individual namespaces within here uh are bubbled up and they're collapsible so if we can expand that you can see like so under dotnet code analysis there's three namespaces, there's 16 name types, there's you know nearly 2,600 lines of source code uh, compiled down. That's roughly you know 
650 lines of code, the highest cyclomatic complexity is 17. And that's that's high. So that's bad. That means that there's some code here you might actually want to pay attention to and try to potentially fix. And then so if it's green, that means you're good. If it's yellow, it's a cautionary tale of yeah. uh, this is kind of getting bad. Don't you know, if you're going to refactor it, you know, it might be a good area. Uh, but some of these other things here get pretty bad. So if you expand into those uh, file utilities, this is the class. So this class uh, contains 17 members mm -hmm. and it has uh, this many lines of code, this many uh, executable code. And then it actually shows like, here's the member kind. So this is a method. Uh, here's a field, all these different things. And it's actually got the line numbers. It's got the yeah. maintainability index. Uh, depth of inheritance, class coupling, all the stuff is right here for you. So you can kind of quickly evaluate and see like, okay, this is the bad area. So method here on line, uh, this line. So if we click on it, it actually has deep linking into the line number mm -hmm. of that source code file. So this Just says, right. here's here's the actual file in question. This is the method that's problematic. So private static string question mark, resolved relative path, given this stuff right here. So it shows you, as you can see, this is a pretty complex yeah. uh, function so this might be something to potentially refactor right okay so did you show us the code like how we are getting to these metrics like especially the executable lines of code <laughs> yeah yeah so that's let me let me switch over real quick and i'll, I'll kind of okay. show you a demo yeah, of this, this is real the, nice. the app and, and in question so this is the actual source code again this is all available up on the samples uh and part of the tutorial i kind of walk you through it uh so the code analysis project right here this is the um, this is the the real worker and it's basically my effort at reverse engineering roslin's uh code metrics executable that exists today for uh code metrics so if i was to click on uh if i right click on um this right here and do analyze and code cleanup if i do calculate code metrics right inside visual studio proper you get the same type of thing that i'm doing mm -hmm. so this is the maintainability in index the cyclomatic complexity the depth of inheritance class coupling and this should be pretty much identical but this source code this is open source it's available under roslin's analyzers and it's all there it was actually tied to dotnet framework so i had to reverse engineer it and make it compatible with dotnet 5 and such that i could containerize it and run it in the context of you know, Ubuntu, right? So that was the fun part. And that's what this effort is here, this this code analysis project. But um, my uh, my consuming executable, the console app, the GitHub action itself, this is really uh, just a, dot, a .NET console application. And I'll show you this real quick. It's uh, using language version 9, .NET 5. So this is all the latest bits. Uh, nullable context enabled. And there's a few things that it's relying on. So I'm relying on um, some third party uh, packages. <clears throat> I see there's a, a comment there. Do I need to read that or no? Uh, uh, Dan's talking to Scoops about uh, how big Alpine is. Uh, but this is some pretty cool stuff. Uh, Chris is impressed, which is it's hard <laughs> to impress Chris. Ha has David Fowler seen this? Uh, yeah, I showed this to him. This is pretty sweet. He wanted me to containerize .NET Crank, which is their benchmarks framework. So I've been working mm. on that. Um, all right. So what this does is uh, there's it's relying on a Markdown builder. And this is a third-party package. So basically, it lets you just work with strings and then build out like a Markdown document. And then when you call to string, it's got basically uh, a semantic version or a semantic kind of markup for Markdown based on objects from C Sharp. So you can say, here's a new... Um, uh, markdown table here's the rows for that table here's the the column values all that stuff and then it just pff, two strings oh, so, so when you run this from visual studio like what it spits out uh like what is it that you are converting to markdown like what is it that it's spitting out uh it's converting um the code metrics analysis the results of this library i'll, I'll show you that in just a second okay. I, right. I just wanted to give some attributions and acknowledgements to some of these third party sure, sure. things real quick and then there's a command line parser. So basically, this parser lets us uh, hook into the standard uh, CLI uh, arguments that come into play. And then there's some of the other standard bits. And then, like I said, this one's got a project reference to the code analysis. So we've got a top level statement. Uh, let me make sure this is zoomed in enough. Let's zoom in a little bit more. 
So we have a, a top level statement. Since this is C sharp nine, we can do that. So rather than having like the program and the main, uh, imagine that it's, that's boilerplates all here for you implicitly. So we've got our using statements. Um, I'm using a lot of things, uh, which is neither here nor there. Um, and then we have a, a host. So we, actually, we can actually do proper dependency injection in our .NET console applications, right? So we can say host, create our default builder, given our args. Args is implicit because it's uh, in the context of our top level statement. We can configure services. And then from there, I actually have an extension method inside this code analysis uh, that basically wires up our GitHub action services that, uh, actually, no, where's this one? Let me go look at that real quick. Ta-da. So we're going to add our, <laughs> Dan, this top level statement stuff is going to take them a while to get used to. Yeah. Uh, it, once you get used to it though, it's, it's, I think it's pretty slick. How, how new is this? It's with uh, C sharp nine. So November of last year. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So then, uh, I've also learned like you can actually um, use the usings like as you are typing stuff, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's that's new to me because then apparently it it does the disposal quicker. Like uh, if if you do it like while you're entering a method, then it disposes of it while you're done. Yeah, it's it's an implicit. So this is uh, the using declarations. That's what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's there's lots of. Uh, enhancements with C Sharp that mm -hmm. I've been keeping up on. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a static local function here. And this helper function basically says, give me a T service. So then I walk up to our host services and I get required services. So it's just basically a way for me to get services uh, given their type from the host, right? So I use that here. Uh, so then I've got this function to start the analysis async. Um, given the action inputs. So I haven't really talked much about inputs and outputs, and that's something I should probably focus on right now. So I have an action inputs class, and that action inputs class basically defines um, several things. These options are coming from the command line parser third-party library that I mentioned. So we've got our owner, we have the name of the repository, the branch of the repository, uh, the directory. This is the root directory to start our recursive searching uh, from. So for our analysis, this is where we're going to start looking. And then our workspace directory. So uh, of those values, um, those are just basically defined as inputs. So in our action YAML, I'm going to jump over there real quick. Our action YAML is what tells GitHub that are uh, from the action YAML root. Basically, that is um, that's that represents a GitHub action. So this file takes uh, specifies the name, so code metrics and analyzer, the description, the branding. So the branding has an icon and color, and these things are well documented from GitHub. So you can actually choose mm -hmm. like mine's the sliders and the purple color. They have a finite set of colors that are available to you and a finite set of icons that you can use. Uh, and then from there, you specify your inputs, whether or not they're required, like so the name, the description, whether or not they're required, and then outputs. So in your action itself, uh, you're defining your inputs and your outputs. And then outputs, uh, things that I'm promising to return are as like a summary title, uh, the summary details, and then whether or not uh, metrics have been updated. And then once you have those inputs, outputs, branding, and the name, you would specify how it runs. And then this is where you get into uh, saying that your action is going to run using Docker, right? Mm -hmm. Since it's a .NET app. And then it's going to use the image, which is defined as our Docker file. And then these are the arguments into uh, the startup of the application. So we're going to pass in the inputs coming from up here. So our, the owner, the name, the branch, the directory, and the workspace. And these will actually tie into our command line parser from the starting of our council application. So as you can imagine, the GitHub action triggers. It starts up, the VM spins up. Once the VM is spun up, it's going to check out the code. It's going to say, oh, we need to go now pull uh, this GitHub action, which is a Docker container. So it pulls it down, and then it starts it up. And then once it starts it up, it says we need to pass these arguments to it. These arguments go into it. And then basically .NET spins up and says, OK, now we're running in the context of this container. It doesn't need to know that but it's running in the context of this container, here are the arguments. And that's where the entry point to this program starts off. 
Okay, right? I got a, I got another dumb question here. So, yeah. <laughs> so GitHub reads your YAML and it says, "Oh, yep. I need Ubuntu," uh, and then uh, it it bootstraps everything. And so, at at what point? Like, I'll go back to your action inputs file. Like, who reads that? Is that after the app is loaded up? This is part of uh, GitHub. So GitHub uh, reads this file, and that's what identifies that as being a uh, a GitHub action. So this is uh, once. So let me go back here real quick. So once you have, uh, bum, 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 jumping all over the place. So once you have, where's that YAML? This thing right here. So this workflow YAML. Um, so there, there's a difference between an action YAML and a workflow YAML. A workflow YAML specifies the composition of actions that you want to compose together, right? This is the workflow. This is like what will start up our pipeline. So when I say that I want to rely on uh, .NET samples, GitHub actions uh, at main, this basically points GitHub to my action YAML file and says, that's mm -hmm. what I want to start. I so. See. GitHub's aware of that and it sees that. And then once it sees that, it's like, okay, here's how it's defined. Here's the things I can do. So it knows what it's expecting. So its inputs are owner, name, branch, for example. And if I toggle back over here real quick, you'll see that I say with owner, name, and branch. So that's how the flow uh, of, of values kind of goes through this system. And it's pretty elaborate, right? There's, a, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts. And it might seem like it's overly complex, um, <clears throat> but again, it's it's basically yeah, it's, it's unlimited it's, power. I think yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and Dan is suggesting that uh, you should get uh, some minutes on the build keynote and talk about this. <laughs> that, oh, that'd no, be this fun. Is, this is good. This is good. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's uh, there's all those fun moving parts. Um, so now once you have uh, that in place. Uh, the program starts up, so I'm going to minimize this real quick. So now that we have our parser, the parser is using that again that command line parser um, uh, third party package. So we can say parse arguments, and we're going to map those arguments to our action inputs, that object that represents our inputs, right? So then the parser returns with uh, two things. So if it's not parsed, we can just print out our um, <clears throat> excuse me, we can print out why it wasn't parsed and then kind of gracefully exit. Otherwise, we can say parser with parsed async. So this gives us our, uh, our action inputs. And then that's how we're going to actually start the analysis. And then from there we run. So that gets back into the starting right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say get the project workspace. And then from the workspace, uh, we're going to look for cancellation. And we're going to uh, get a project metric data analyzer from our host. And then we've got a matcher. A matcher is a type that you may not be familiar with. I've learned about it just recently, but what it does is it's, it's .NET globbing. Uh, something that's, hmm. there's been, there's been third party packages that have existed for a very long time. Now it's actually part of the extensions. I encourage you to go check it out. So Microsoft.extensions.filesystemglobbing. Uh, that's a really, really fun NuGet package for you. But what it does is it lets you do um, globbing, right? So you can say asterisk, asterisk, forward slash, asterisk dot CS proj. So any, uh, any CS proj, those are the patterns that we want to include, any VB project. So any C Sharp or VB project. And then from there, I'm going to minimize this real quick. We are instantiating a, a new dictionary. And then here's another neat little C sharp tidbit. So when we instantiate a dictionary of string, you might know that there's a string comparer dot ordinal ignore case, uh, right? So basically the keys can be case insensitive, which is great, right? Uh, but you can instantiate it with the target type uh, new. So we can just say new rather than repeating the type declaration here. So see how much more mm -hmm. expressive that is, right? Uh, so then we say matcher, get the results in the full path for our directory. And then now we have all of the projects. So we were able to, from the, the little bits of code there, basically pull all the projects into our projects array uh, or list rather. And then we're going to use our analyzer to analyze it. And this is this gets a little bit complex there. That does some of the reverse engineering from Rosalind, some of the fun bits that will actually evaluate 
your uh, like the semantic model of your C sharp uh, or your VB.net. And then from there, it's able to analyze and, and provide those kind of code metrics for you. So once we get all of the metrics, then I'm really gonna plot them into uh, my metrics data, which is the path and the metrics data value. So the, the file path for the code pod project. And then from there, we're gonna build out our code metrics markdown file, right? If there's more than, uh, if it basically has values, right? So this is uh, C-sharp pattern matching uh, from C sharp, uh, I think this is part of eight where we're no, actually nine because it's doing uh, kind of expression based. So you're, you're all in, like you, you're hardcore on the language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I'm 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 a big nerd when it comes to C sharp nine. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, from that dictionary, we can walk up to it and we can say, if uh, if it is uh, containing a count greater than zero. But this does, this is kind of a compound thing. What it does is it implicitly will check for you whether or not it's null, right? So rather than saying if uh, the metrics data uh, is not null and the count is greater than uh, zero or doing like a dot any or anything like that, you can just basically say if metrics data is having a count greater than zero, done. So if we have some metrics data, then we can basically loop through it and append out um, our, our markdown data. So this is where things get really cool. So I have an extension method on that metrics data type. And what it does is it uses that markdown builder to basically evaluate the entire hierarchy of the metrics data uh, and then create a markdown file. And then once and, and it- what, what is the metrics data? What, what What is the like format? Like how are you getting it? Okay, so that's inside the analyzer. So let's jump into there. So this is, if we go over here, this is inside, where is that? This is over here. Um, so, so basically this is now inside the .NET code analysis uh, project. And uh, this is some of the stuff that I had to reverse engineer. So they have this concept of like a, um, of like a workspace and they have, uh, they were using immutable arrays and uh, the code analysis, um, metrics data so it's you basically have to get like a compilation uh context and then you have to um rip through that compilation context so basically what it does is it uses some of the roslyn apis to take the dotnet code it basically rips it apart compiles it down gets the semantic modeling of it and it's able to run these analytics and and provide these metrics for you uh so once you have that, you can compute it, and then you end up with this metrics data stuff, um, which uh, given the context and the compilation, so it's, again, some of this stuff gets pretty involved. They had to, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff here that I had to kind of reverse engineer. Um, but oh, that's, yeah. that's kind yeah. of out of scope. But what it does is it basically, it uses the Roslyn APIs, it calculates these uh, code metrics data for you, and then it returns back this object that then you can use to do stuff with. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, an another thing I did was I tied it into, uh, as, as just kind of like a, a demo, I'm like, well, can I use this for other repositories rather than just dog booting itself and spitting out the results? So inside my GitHub repo, I'm like, well, let's add it to my Azure Cosmos DB repository, uh, pattern dot at, uh, dot net SDK and see what it does. So I, I was able to, 10 days ago, I did this. I did this right after our live stream. So I added the workflow, I added code metrics, and basically the same thing. So I said, on main, a push to main, um, let's go do code metrics, <laughs> pointing to the, get, uh, the .NET samples, and let's just spin it up and see what happens. And uh, lo and behold, I got a pull request for a code metrics file basically free of charge. So now I've got all of my sample source code, the service tiers, the Azure function tier, the web tier, those are sample applications. Uh, the Azure Cosmos uh, repository, uh-oh, this is going nuclear, so that's pretty great. Uh, 11, so that's pretty high. So this is something I might wanna go look at, but see, this was simply me adding that YAML file, mm -hmm. just adding that YAML file, that workflow YAML file to my existing repository I got a pull request with code metrics for me. Um, I mean, just in a matter of minutes. 
Okay, I, I, I got to say I'm impressed with that Markdown Builder. You, you said, uh, where, where did you get that from? Are you um, yeah, so, so the Markdown Builder itself uh, is pretty awesome. Um, because it's, it's taking that whole mix of data and just it's not a, the markdown. Yeah, I don't think it's like a super popular. Uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Packages, um, markdown builder. It's not like a super popular uh, package. I mean, look at <laughs> it's mm. got 561 downloads. I've already used it in two or three of my projects because I was impressed with it as well. Um, so what it does is it, uh, and this is a, a, a pro tip. So if you're a developer and you want to learn a new API and you're relying on third party package, if they have tests, go look at their tests. Usually their tests show you how they're intending for their API to work. So, you know, like markdown header tests. So they show you, right. How, how to, so that you basically just instantiate all these things, markdown header, here's the text, blah. Right. So. Uh, I'm going to show you how I used it. I actually wrote an extension method that will take uh, the dictionary of string and code matrix uh, analysis, and I say to markdown body given these inputs. So this this is not necessarily code that I'm proud of because it gets kind of ugly, but it's fun to show. Uh, so we instantiate a markdown document with our implicit target type new, and then. We disable markdown linter and capture config. Uh, this is a little helper function that's basically going to say um, markdown lint capture because we're using markdown lint in uh, a lot of our projects. So if you're using the markdown linter, this will actually disable the, the linter warnings that you might get. And then it will re-enable them at a later point in time, right? So the, the top of the file and the bottom of the file have these things written for you on your behalf, assuming that you might have them, but they're they're hidden comments. So you don't actually see them when they're rendered. Uh, and then we're going to just append a header. So this is the code metrics. That's what you see as the header. And we say that this file is dynamically maintained by a bot. Please do not edit by hand. And then we just start iterating through the different um, analytics and start building it out, right? So that you get headers, you get IDs for clicking and linking. And we end up with a list. So here's the markdown list. So mm -hmm. as you remember, I showed you like there's the like there's X number of namespaces. There's X number of name types. Right. Here's the total number of lines. Here's the executable lines. Uh, and then here's the fun part: the the cyc cyclomatic complexity. So I think I have uh, another extension method that toys with that. Let me see. So two cyclomatic complexity emojis. <laughs> so given this metrics here, we have a switch uh, expression. Fun. So this is where switch expressions yeah. get really fun, right? So you can uh, you can actually do ranges and stuff now. So you can say if it's equal to or greater than zero and less than or equal to seven, that's a heavy uh, check mark, and that's that's just this verbatim string. But that renders as that. Um, yeah. Uh, green, green check mark, yeah. yeah, 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 the green check mark, right? <clears throat> and then the same thing if it's if it's eight or nine, well, that's a warning. If it's ten or eleven, that's radioactive. If it's twelve or fourteen, that's the red X. If it's anything else, like this is like basically like an exhaustive uh, kind of catch-all. Uh, boy, that feels good. That's the the quake, like bleeding face, like oh my god, like this is so bad. Uh, yeah. So I mean, all, again, all the source codes out there. Uh, I'm happy to interact with people on um, uh, Twitter or uh, GitHub or anything like that. Check it out. Um, yeah. So um, a couple of questions. So um, uh -huh. where did you get to uh, rendering the table for um, like the here's the file, uh, like the deep linking to the source code? Yeah. And yeah. Showing the... Yep. Um, so what I do is I've got like another helper function that basically returns a uh, tuple. Um, so here's the assembly ID, the assembly display name, the assembly link, and the assembly's highest complexity. So rather than creating an object, I have just like a tuple that will return those different types of things. And it's called two ID and anchor pair given in metrics. So Jeez, it's, it's fun to look at your code. Like you're such a language nerd. Like, <laughs> I'm such a dork. I know. You People are, are like, what are you doing? Things, yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I, uh, I've kind of become like a, a language snob where uh, everything's super expressive. And uh, I feel like I talk to computers. It's kind of weird. I need help. I need more friends, apparently. <laughs> uh, 
uh, scoop, uh, the scoops was asking, how did you change the operator science? I'm, I'm guessing like back on the switch uh, is, is what's being asked. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, where is that? Give me one. Is it second. a custom font? Like, Joe is yeah, saying? yeah. So this right here, these are actually, co um, yeah, uh, it's the the Fira Fira font. Uh, mm. So Fira font basically, uh, if I put a space here, you'll see. So it's equals uh, greater than together. It's uh, it's a, a programming ligature. Yeah. So uh, these ligatures are available with different custom fonts. Uh, Fira is one of them. Um, uh, the, the Cascadia is the other one from Microsoft, uh, I believe. Yeah, I, I like Fira. I, I think Fira is great. It's it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and how how old are switches in C sharp? How old is switch? Yeah. Is it C sharp? Um, well, no, maybe even before. The, no, well, so the switch uh, switch statements have been around for since the language came out, but switch expressions, that's what this expressions is. Expressions is, yeah, what I mean, um, yeah. I, I think switch expressions, uh, I don't know if it was C-sharp 7 or 8, but they've been getting more and more advanced as time goes on. This is actually uh, C-sharp 9 because we're able to in, introduce um, kind of these expressions, uh, you know, pattern matching based in, in, in these, uh, you know, case arms. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a range of things, and it's it's mm -hmm. just so ele elegant. This it is. Oh my gosh, can you imagine writing this another way? Like how? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, not fun, but cool. Okay, so um, every, everything that you said, this is all open source, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and um, try to post that link one more time, and then ask you a few more questions. Oh uh, boy, where was it? Uh... Oh, you asked about the tables. I didn't even get to finish that because it was oh, yeah, yeah, fun yeah, of me. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so what I will do with those is I'll basically create a div that has an ID, and that ID is then linkable later on. So that ID will flow through to a, a lower part where I can link back to it. Uh, so let's see here. Once I get further down, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, add. Yeah, this right here links back to parent namespace. So that that link is basically provided for you. So like from the thing that's creating the identifier, uh, that link yeah. is then flowed through later on. So then it creates, and that that link is pretty dorky as well because it's got like the little um, uh, emoji formatting and whatnot. So oh boy, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. And like you said, like when this is not like fun code, but you're literally building the markdown and just giving it its own like personality in the yep. table yep. the linking. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh it's it wouldn't be super fun to maintain if you're not familiar with the code, I guess is a good a good thing to say. Um but it it was fun to write. <laughs> uh, what are you having to encode? Oh, the display name of uh like the link, right? Where it's going. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, it might have like any like any special characters. Yeah, so that was part of the thing I started discovering is actually things have to be. Um, we have to to ensure that we're HTML encoding things and we're preparing element identifiers. Uh, they might have different characters in them, different things like some of the namespaces, some of the things from our metrics. Like when they're uh, especially with like generics, uh, like you end up with like all these angle brackets mm -hmm. and different things. So it's like, oh my gosh, we need to trim this out. <laughs> Otherwise, it just it wouldn't work. Oh yeah, yeah. So lots of fun stuff here to check out. Hopefully, hopefully this is valuable to the viewers. Yeah, hopefully no, they this, get something from it. This is gold. So let me ask you um, kind of an overall question. So that that's the link again, folks. So uh, so mm -hmm. that's the link where David kind of walks you through how he built it. And okay, so here's the question: like for us to be consuming this, so I can mm -hmm. see two ways. One is like I can just throw this on any uh, source control. To get mm -hmm. code metrics and yep. have that uh, markdown file updated anytime I push. Is that yep. right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to share this link right here. This is actually, if you're to grab this verbatim, uh, not that one. I'm going to grab this other one here. Yeah, this one here. So if you're to grab this verbatim YAML file and put it as your workflow uh, in any .NET, C Sharp, or VB project, you will get a pull request automatically for the code metrics for that. So that, the thing I just pasted there in chat. I don't yeah, know if yeah. answer. I can see, yeah, yeah, hang on, let me see. Um, and uh, yeah, Joe, uh, good to see you. Good to see you as always, but this is, this is really cool stuff. 
Oh, sorry. Maybe I may have like double. No, no, that's that's the whole link. Yeah. 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 This is uh, this is impressive stuff. This is. I mean, one we we are learning C sharp from you because <laughs> I I have not used uh, half of these things. So this is impressive, and um, the way you're rendering the markdown. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is this is really there's helpful. a lot. <laughs> there's, there's a lot, lot. there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, some of the stuff that we've pieces. covered, we we've we briefly touched on GitHub Actions, the inputs, the outputs, the specifying of parameters, the how to create them with .NET, how to pass in uh, command line arguments from uh, your workflow composition, how to then create pull requests, how to render uh, Markdown, and this is just scraping honestly the surface. Like this is just one idea. Like there's so much more that you can do with this. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's literally uh it's literally i don't know seemingly endless I, I i mean that sounds so cliche but it's it's honest like i mean yeah. uh, imagine being able to i i had thought about maybe doing like one that spits out jokes like when you have like uh when you comment on something uh uh you know it, it sends you a joke or something right it comments like a bot's just making fun of you or something or uh or, or yeah. maybe like a, a bot that like basically humiliates you that's like oh why would you do this when you could do that like it evaluates your code <laughs> and or yeah there's all i mean whatever like you can literally do anything okay so one more question here so mm -hmm. like the inputs uh thing that you showed like when you ran um the manual action for the first time like you had github give you a drop down and it just picked, picked it up but are there uh possibilities of putting in hooks so i could say don't look at this CS proj file because I, I don't want the metrics on this one or like any anything custom that I might want to do. Like, are there hooks where we could customize things while we run this? Absolutely. So uh, there, there's uh, filters. So on the different paths, so you can trigger on different things, you can trigger on different branches. Uh, and then from those things, you are the one that's ultimately in control of uh, all the globbing patterns for how you want to analyze things inside the context of your action itself. So, I mean, if you basically throw an idea out there and I'll tell you whether or not it's possible. The answer is probably yes. <laughs> not the are you stupid bot, but uh, yeah, Any, anything else. Are you stupid bot? <laughs> uh, I actually had written um, one a, a while ago uh, that was, it was relying on the older infrastructure. So I, I wrote a GitHub action that served as a profanity filter. So what it would do is if anyone created a pull request or an issue that had profanity in the header or in the body of the, that issue or pull request, and there was like, you know, swear words, I would automatically replace it with like emojis. And I would label it as profane content, right? And it was like this really compelling story of like, you know what? That's one of the best ways with open source. Like open source is, since it's open, you get to interact with so many different people and everyone has different feelings about certain things. So if they're fired up and they come into your repository and they're just swearing and they're upset and they're frustrated and they let that you let you, you know, let you have it. Uh, imagine being able to instantly defuse that with, all right, their issue is rewritten with emojis. Now, now it's a lot more palatable. I can walk up to that issue and be like, yeah, I can see they're upset, but I'm not that upset about it because it's all like, you know, rainbows and ponies. Yeah. Yeah, so one is like we could use this like straight up um, to get more visibility in our code, but also just like looking through your source code is going to tell us a lot of the things that Visual Studio does, like Roslyn does to analyze and, and do some of the things that you're doing. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not on yourself. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, this is funny. Um, Ken is here. <laughs> oh, I'm seeing their messages now. Apparently, I'm supposed <laughs> to be in another meeting. Uh, that's cool. Uh, All right. So, oh, uh, oh, yeah, I got to go. Okay. All right. I got to go. I got to we'll go. let you go. Yeah, we'll All let right. you go. All right. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and drop you off here. But, All right. Uh, thank you so much, David. Yep. This is impressive. Bye, friends. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay, folks, uh, you don't want to see me that big, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, let's see if we can, uh, if we could uh, go ahead and raid uh, Fritz here, who's been on for a while. I don't know if he's ending up. Um, 
but uh, yeah, Scott Addy is here. Uh, yeah, you all left me alone. No, it's all it's all good. We're at the top of the hour, anyways. And who wants to see a big face of me? But uh, that was very impressive stuff from David. Uh, we learned a bunch with uh, actions. Yeah, peace out, uh, Chris. And uh, that's it from me um, as well. So uh, the counter is running for the raid. So I'll go ahead and let you all go. But uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, I'll be here next Thursday. So have a good time. Okay. And uh, stay healthy, stay safe, stay productive. And I should see you on the next stream. Okay. Bye bye.